Okay. Welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicola O'Brien and I'm co-presenting with Sujatha Gunja today. We are both education specialists in the team at the Australian Computing Academy um, and today we're here to talk to you about assessment. Just a couple of words to let you know this webinar is being recorded so uh, if any of your colleagues would like to watch a copy later they can do so. Um, we will run a couple of, we're running a poll at the moment, so I would appreciate your responses to that. And before we get started, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian Computing Academy acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. Uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, explore the topic of assessment within digital technologies. We'll have a particular focus on algorithms and also implementation. Uh, what we'll do is Sujatha will firstly walk us through what we're talking about with assessment and take a look at some ideas for assessment through algorithms. Um, and then in the second part of the webinar today, we're actually going to walk you through and show you First time ever eyes have seen this outside of the ACA, an assessment tool that we have created, um, specifically aimed at Year 5-6, but this is the first of what may turn into a series of assessment tasks. So if you're not a 5-6 teacher, uh, we're looking for opinions and suggestions from teachers to improve these, and we will hopefully have an opportunity to develop them for other year groups as well. Over to you. Okay, lovely. Right, so today we're going to spend the next hour talking about uh, assessment, but I thought I'd spend a, a few seconds just quickly reminding everyone around the goals of um, aligning curriculum assessment and teaching. Um, classroom practitioners, uh, you would know this already, uh, but it's still a really worthwhile endeavor, particularly when you're planning um, new modules, when you're planning new teaching, new units of work, and new assessment tasks like we have, uh, to ensure that it always aligns with the curriculum and uh, in turn it aligns to uh, aligns with what you're doing in the classroom as far as teaching is concerned. In terms of understanding what we assess, we look at the ACARA achievement standards. Now um, we have participants from a range of um, states around the country. So in some states, uh, you're implementing um, the national curriculum, digital technologies, as it was written. Uh, and in other states, for example, WA, New South Wales, uh, there is a state specific implementation. So regardless of where you are uh, listening from um, today, uh, or in this webinar, if you're listening to it later on, uh, the ACARA achievement standards is a really good and really important um, point for you to work out what that learning journey is going to be for your students um, and where they need to be by the end of the band level uh, that you're teaching. I'm just trying to go to the next slide here. Okay, so when we have such a large achievement standard, it can be difficult to work out what exactly you're doing. So today, for the purposes of our assessment task, we're going to be looking at two small parts of the year five and six achievement standards. So we're going to look at algorithms uh, and the achievement standards state that uh, students should be able to generate record design ideas um, for algorithms using graphical and non-graphical representation techniques. So we'll go through some examples. Uh, and secondly, for implementation, so programming, coding, whatever you uh, call it uh, in your school context, we're going to be creating digital solutions um, that include user interfaces and visual programming languages. So having said that, we'll go to the next slide. So a lot of the work in terms of the curriculum, so the Cara curriculum writers had two pages to uh, cram a whole bunch of content, skill, intent, values, all the things that go into a curriculum document. And out of those two pages, it's very, very hard for uh, classroom teachers to work out the granularity and the detail of what exactly does um, algorithms look like 
at a year three, four level versus a five, six level. Uh, and what does it mean? It's one sentence in the curriculum. So the ACA's Unpacking the Curriculum website has a lot of details. If you've been to any of our webinars before, uh, you would have heard uh, people in the team talk about this, but this is a really useful site for you to bookmark, uh, regardless of what teaching resources you use for digital technologies. The Unpacking the Curriculum website, firstly, gives you a lot more depth um, and uh, the, this section is actually written by the four original curriculum authors. So it's actually straight from the horse's mouth as well. And two of the curriculum authors uh, work for the Australian Computing Academy and the other two are consultants for it. So this is a really good website for you to um, bookmark. And so the breakdown of what is expected uh, comes from the curriculum and the detail for it is accessible through the unpacking website. So if we look at uh, for algorithms, uh, it starts off fairly simple in the foundation to year two uh, age uh, or band level. So students are expected to follow, describe and represent a sequence of steps and decisions. So we're keeping it really, really simple. At this stage, students are acquiring foundational literacy, foundational numeracy, along with all the things that go with uh, being a part of the school community and following routines and all of that. Uh, and then in year three and four, we start to layer some of the more um, some more complexity to that. So rather than just follow it, we want students to be able to describe and follow. Uh, and in five and six, uh, there is an expectation of some simple design elements as well. Now, uh, I had a chat with the team when we were doing this and we thought, okay, how do we actually, oh, what's going on here, Nicola? Is it just, it's just skipping across. Okay. Um, we, we chatted with the team and we said, okay, what exactly does algorithms and assessment of algorithms looks like, look like in the primary classroom? And we realized that the primary curriculum uh, across the KLAs is absolutely ripe with opportunities uh, for teachers to integrate digital technologies. And it's not very many uh, key concepts or concepts in the digital technologies curriculum that can do that so seamlessly. Um, so for the next part, we we'd like you to use the annotation feature so if you haven't used this before, it's just on the view options um, near the top of your screen um, and you should be able to click the annotate button. So what we'd like you to do is um, we'd like you to use the annotate feature. So in particular, there is the stamps. So if you can use a stamp and it doesn't matter which one you want to use, um, if you can use a stamp to indicate whether you currently teach algorithms um, in English, math, science, has arts, technologies, HP, or languages, whether um, you're teaching it, whether you're assessing it. Uh, so we'd like to see the range of what teachers are currently doing. Um, firstly, because we love talking to teachers and we want to know what exactly is happening in classroom around the country. Uh, but secondly, this will also give us a really good insight at the ACA team to say, hang on a second, teachers are doing so much work with algorithms in English. Uh, let's find out what that looks like and what that practice looks like. Um, so in terms of, okay, I don't know why this is just racing across. So we'll just leave this on for another minute. Um, the next few slides, I'm gonna be showing some very specific examples these are just examples. You might be doing some of these already and you might, or you might be doing uh, something quite different. Um, so just leave this for another couple of seconds. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do with this information, we'll take a quick screenshot of it, is to know where we can support teachers further. So uh, for example, HPE has one star. Uh, and so we might say, okay, let's find some more opportunities to develop algorithm resources that tie more closely with the HP curriculum. Okay, wonderful. So I'm just going to um, clear the annotations here. Okay, and then we're just going to continue on. Um, okay, next slide. Right, so English, for example, um, when you teach English grammar, uh, English teachers, you do this all the time. You're constantly getting students to uh, learn the rules of the language, learn the rules of tense, uh, in particular present progressive is a really nice, um, it's a really nice example. So uh, if it's a very simple verb, you might say, okay, uh, you start with the verb and you add ing to the end. And as students' understanding becomes more sophisticated, you might introduce some of these other rules. And these are the rules of the English language that translate beautifully across to um, algorithms as well. On the next slide, uh, we have, sorry, we have an example for plural forms as well. Um, 
you know, very simple. You can just start with a word and you can add ES to it. Um, if it ends in S, SS, CH, and so on, there are also other rules. If it ends in F, FE, um, and then you can start to introduce exceptions. So again, you're currently teaching this anyway. Um, so you don't need to teach algorithms separately as a digital technologies concepts because it, uh, it already exists in your current teaching practice and it aligns really nicely with uh, the English curriculum. Similarly, with mathematics, um, when students get to year five and six, they learn how to add two digit numbers and they might be able to articulate it really well. So the next step is, well, write down the rules for this. What might that look like? Uh, and so this is just one way of uh, representing the algorithm for adding two two digit numbers. And if you have a student that's um, more academically able or is ready for a challenge, you might say to them, okay, how might you change this algorithm to add three two digit numbers? What if we wanted to add any, two, any number of two digit numbers. So uh, you can actually extend the algorithm and get them thinking about uh, scaling this to solve a whole bunch of different problems. And there you're starting to touch upon some of the expectations that students will be looking at when they get to high school as well. So teachers, particularly those of you teaching in five and six, um, what makes it trickier for you is that you might have students who would be working at a band level below and you also have students who might be ready for high school level digital technology. So finding problems that allow you to scale up for either side of that band level um, makes your life just that little bit easier. And this is one of those examples uh, that you can scale quite nicely. Um, on the next slide, um, if you're teaching science, so this is one of the science outcomes we quickly grabbed from ACARA, um, science experiment to measure health um, and height of a plant when you water it for 10 days, uh, so you can represent it as a really simple algorithm. And again, if you want to change this to say instead of 10 days, we're gonna be monitoring the plant for 20 days, uh, it's just a modification of the algorithm. So you can actually have lots and lots of these examples um, that aren't too removed from your current examples in the classroom, uh, and you just have to adapt it to the language used in the digital technologies curriculum. Music is fabulous for that as well. Um, we might start off by singing verse one, chorus, verse two, chorus. Then we might um, extend it along to actually adding a loop when they get to five and six and say, okay, you know what, there's a pattern here. Uh, we might have two verses, we might have 25 verses, or if it's um, you know 99 bottles of whatever on the wall, that's 99 verses. So you can actually scale up your algorithms to reflect uh, what students um, are learning about in terms of the music content as well. HP, this is actually a really lovely example. Okay, so this is completely going haywire. Nicola, I'm not sure why. Um, I love this because... Sorry, Sujatha, can I just jump in for a moment? Sorry, I can't yeah. see anything on my screen, but I know that we have some people in the waiting room. If you could okay, let... Okay, so I'll just admit all. Thank you so much. No problems. Right. Sorry, it's just the screens are jumping around and this is not the thing I wanted to be at. Are you on the cool. Yeah, okay. Um, this particular representation of an algorithm, it doesn't use words and it doesn't use uh, traditional flowchart symbols. Uh, and this is, this is a series of diagrams to teach soccer drills. Um, so it doesn't have to be the formalized sit down and draw something. Uh, you can give these diagrams to a year three and year four student and get them to understand what this algorithm is actually trying to get them to do. Uh, and the assessment of this is them actually being able to follow this algorithm uh, in a playground or in, a, in the schoolyard. Um, nextly, uh, in terms of HAPS, uh, really simple examples so in year three and four algorithms, uh, students need to be able to handle decisions. And a lovely example is deciding whether uh, an item can be um, recycled or not. So uh, having a decision there, and if it can be recycled, we place it in the green recycling bin. Uh, if it can't be, we place it in the red recycling bin. Uh, sorry, red rubbish bin. And again, this is a very scalable problem because when we get to five and six, we add the loop that's expected to say uh, we're checking for more items. Uh, so three, four, we're just assuming we're dealing with one item at a time. Uh, and then when we get to five and six, uh, we can actually be dealing with an entire, um, uh, uh, what's the word, a whole stack of garbage and actually process all of them till we sort them into recyclable and non-recyclable products. Um, next one, where did my mouse go? Okay, so with, 
what this looks like. So there's just some examples here. You'll have um, a copy of the slide deck when we put the webinar online. Um, but there's some examples here that tie back to all the various things that primary educators do in the classroom every day, whether it be teaching students about life cycles of um, butterflies or chicken, or um, getting students to follow instructions to build Lego, um, getting them to describe the rules for scissors, paper, rock, or battleships is a really nice one as well. Um, and in five, six, getting them to use a procedure for science and asking them to convert it into a flow chart. Um, in mathematics, designing an algorithm to decide if a number is odd or even. So some of these problems um, are, a lot of, all of them are real world problems, but many of them can actually be then translated, particularly in year three, four, five, six, into implementation and students can actually code it and program it to um, create their solution. So I'm just watching the time. Um, when we come into implementation, uh, it's not an expectation for foundation to year two that you must explicitly address implementation. Now, many schools, including the school I was at uh, a few years ago, uh, we had B-Bots in the primary, in the kindy classroom, we had um, Scratch in the year one, Scratch junior, and so on. All that is fine. If you're doing that, that's great. Uh, but there is no um, explicit expectation that you should uh, teach it or assess it. If you're doing it, that's great. But really, three, four, five, six is where uh, you need to do it as far as the curriculum is concerned. Uh, and the main difference between three, four, five, six is that uh, in three, four, we're mainly looking at um, simple problems with branching and user input. Uh, and then in five, six, we add uh, iteration and repetition to that as well. Now, the curriculum clearly says visual programs, but those of you who are teaching five and six, you may well find students that um, have got a really good command of visual programming. Um, there is no harm in extending them to some simple general purpose programming that's needed uh, for year seven. Again, uh, that's up to you uh, and your judgment as an educator. You know your students, um, but you can certainly do that. But this is where uh, the expectation is that you use visual programming language. Uh, where is my mouse? Okay, so a general format that many teachers have told us that they do is that they work through one of our DT challenges. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of resources on the ACA website. Um, at last count, over 30 courses that are online, self-paced, um, thoroughly mapped to the curriculum. And we've got a lot of them for the primary years as well. Uh, and they align to the curriculum really well. So what a lot of teachers do is that they set their students a challenge to work through. Um, they use it for formative assessment. So there are a few tools on our website that you can use um, to check live what your kids are doing, uh, which is great. Um, and we also have teachers that use lots of other formative assessment methods. So they might have um, exit slips, they might, might do cahoots, they might do little quizzes uh, to check for understanding in the classroom. But in terms of the summative tasks, each of our challenges also has what's called a playground. So these are open-ended um, toolkits where your students can pretty much design and create whatever they want. Uh, in some schools, the teachers design the problem and make the students do it. Uh, other schools, um, it's actually student-generated uh, problems as well. So again, it depends on your context, uh, your, your comfort in being able to um, support that, but um, we've got a few different options there. So today what we wanted to do is we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so showing you um, the assessment task we have designed for a specific DT challenge. And this is a summative assessment task. Uh, and so the Blockly Turtle Challenge, so we've got the link there and all these links um, are online, online anyway. You can go to the ACA website and, and get them. Um, the Blockly Turtle Challenge uh, is an online course where students can again go through uh, the skills and the um, resources they need to solve small problems. And when they get to the end of that or close to the end of that, there is an assessment that we have created. So at the moment it's in draft and you're the first people outside the ACA team to look at it, um, which is great. So we've got the short link there and I might just um, put the link on the chat panel so that you can download that. Okay. So this assessment is in two parts. So the first part is a worksheet because we know that 
um, technology access can sometimes be an issue and the best laid plans of um, everyone go awry. So we realized that it's really important to have two forms of assessment. Um, so Nicholas is showing the, oh, oh sorry. You just, you just ended the, I did. I'll go back in. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're just going to go back to the, Nicola, can you go back to the slide deck, please? Sure. I've lost remote control privileges. It's the assessment webinar, the third panel. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. So the first part um, partially aligns to the algorithms content descriptor, and the second part aligns to the assessment content descriptor. So I'm going to hand over to Nicola, and she's going to go through uh, the details of what part one and part two look like. Again, as you have any questions, just pop it in the chat, uh, and then I'll come back at the end to go through the rubric as well. So what we'd like you to do is um, uh, have a look through the, the draft that we provided you, um, and we'd like the opportunity for you to sort of give us some feedback, um, and uh, it's still in draft, and we hope to have it published on our website um, in the next couple of weeks, certainly before the start of next term. So Nicola, over to you. Thank you, Sir Jatha. Um, so if you follow that short link, you'll jump across into this OneDrive folder, which you can all access and view the files in. Um, as Sujatha mentioned, this is an assessment task designed for year five and six students who have completed the DT Challenge uh, Block League Turtle, which is a uh, visual programming task that teaches students how to make artworks using the turtle tools. And so what we've designed is student worksheet. So in this task what we wanted to do was uh, think about the cognitive load on students and step them through some different ways of checking their understanding of key concepts. Uh, so for some students we know that they can understand code but they might have challenges in writing the code themselves or creating a project from a blank page. So this assessment task is designed to build up from sort of very simple can you understand what the steps are to a keystone project at the end of the online part of the assessment, which is to create quite an ambitious project from scratch. And we build them up as we go. So the intention is that students would begin with this worksheet and spend, uh, what did we think, Sujatha, maybe an hour or two here before jumping into the online module. Yeah, it's very hard to come up with a time for it uh, because every classroom is different, uh, but we, expect no more than two hours for this. Most students uh, would be able to get through this in about 40 minutes. If that is six questions, yeah. So the first thing that we do is give the students um, We've followed a methodology called PRIM, which uh, if those are interested in learning more, starts with the first step of learning to predict. So we ask students to predict what this code would do. For a bit of fun, if you can predict what that would do, feel free to answer it in the chat channel. Um, and let us know what you think this code would do with the turtle. I'll give you a moment to think about it. I'm keeping an eye on my chat. I wonder if anyone's game to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully if you've done the turtle course, you could recognize a pattern in this code here that we are placing a pen down. Um, there are four 100 step movements and four left turns, which uh, after completing the course, we believe pretty much all the students can trace and see that that would draw a square filled in with the color yellow. So this is our first step. And we provide a little bit of scaffolding for the answer as this is the first problem of the assessment task. Um, then we like to ask them, and this part of the challenge is really looking at um, algorithms, so students following instructions and modifying instructions. It's not assessing what we call implementation or coding skills, it's assessing their understanding of the instructions. So we ask them to write down the line numbers of code that controls the length of each side. So we can see here that line three, line five, line seven and nine are each determining the length of a side in the task. Um, this question here, what would happen if all the left turns were turned to right turns? And it's a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I can't see anyone jumping into the chat yet. Maybe you'd like me to give you the answer. Um, it, 
the answer would be, this is quite a nice question to differentiate because the code will still draw a square. Um, and so that would be an acceptable answer. On the other hand, uh, for the kids that are going a little bit deeper, it will draw a square, but in a different place on the screen. And it will orientate it differently by the turtle moving to the right, not the left on the first turn. Uh, the next thing we do once we've had the students read some code, um, we want to change that code. So we're moving beyond predicting into um, modifying, which is one of the steps in the prim framework. What would you have to change to make that square go from a square to a rectangle? And there would be two lines if we look back uh, to draw it in that particular shape with the longer first line, lines three and line seven, we'd need to extend. So Jatha, if anything interesting comes through chat, let me know because I can't see the chat. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will. Keep going. Um, All good. Okay. Um, and then we get into a slightly trickier question. So use this code and it's getting longer now, actually. Um, you know, these blockly blocks do add up quickly. We have a shape here with a green and a yellow rectangle. And we ask the students, the first thing is that we've deliberately put some bugs. So testing is a very important part of working with algorithms and implementation, um, following the steps and for inputs, seeing what the outputs would be. So we've thrown a few errors into the code and the children will need to have quite a detailed step-by-step -step walkthrough to identify the errors um, and circle the line numbers. And then question F, what would be drawn if we removed some of the lines? Now, Lines nine to 11 are these ones here, which sit between the two rather larger pieces of code, which draw a yellow and it says blue, but that's one of our bugs. What would be a green rectangle? What happens if you take out the steps in between? And again, this is a trickier question for students because we still draw a yellow rectangle and we still draw a blue or green rectangle. Um, taking out the bits in the middle are the steps which reposition the turtle. And so what you would find if you ran the code without those lines is the two rectangles would land on top of each other and the green one would obliterate the yellow one. You'd only see one rectangle. Um, so quite tricky there for the children to conceptualize, but you know, with a pen and paper and working through, they could solve that problem by tracing through step by step, which is a skill we'd really like to see our students develop. So that's the worksheet part of it, which has a focus on algorithms. I'll jump across now and show you the online part, which is up here. Let's have a look. Now, for those of you who are familiar with using our DT challenges, uh, they normally come with quite chatty commentary. They come with lots of tips. They have little light bulb moments to guide you. The assessment task, we really just ask them to do something without any learning associated with it. So you wouldn't enroll your students in this module without them having completed the turtle challenge. But what we've done is built six problems that increase in complexity and also in terms of cognitive load. So the first question looks like a bit of a hot mess of code, but what this is, it's called a Parsons problem. So the students need to rearrange the code to get to a desired out output. Uh, they don't need to go and find all the code blocks themselves um, and they don't need to start from nothing. So to draw three squares in a row, the students would hopefully think, okay, these repeat blocks, one of these will do each of my squares. And you know, I know that the first one's red, so maybe I'll bring that one here. And then I have a yellow one, and then I have a blue one. And with the available blocks, they would think, and start to build up just what it is that they need to do to make the pattern shown on screen. Um, so this question is an introduction for them. Luckily, uh, for those looking at it with us today, we have sample solutions prepared and you can click a button yourself and preload the solution. Uh, obviously the students don't have access to that page, but um, this is for you, so you can feel very supported. And um, one of the questions I guess we wanted to throw out to teachers and we're happy to chat after today's webinar about was um, to what extent should we be supporting the students through this. Um, our usual marker provides a lot of hinting 
And so if you have parts of the solution correct and parts of them not quite there, you'll get hints to say, this works, this part doesn't quite work. Um, and we were having some interesting discussions in-house about um, how you could influence, I guess, students' engagement with the task and whether that helped from an assessment point of view or not. So did we want to provide all that hinting and give children multiple chances to get the question right? Or did we want to have submit as many times as you like, but we won't hint you to sort of get you along the way. It's up to you to test and see what your output should be. Um, likewise, should a student know that maybe problem one is incorrect before trying problem two? Um, would that influence their approach and engagement with problem two? Or is it better that they submit all six without knowing at each step which ones are correct and not? So really interested to hear from you before we kind of lock this down and finalize it whether you would prefer students to get hinting, whether you'd like them to know their progress as they go. So moving on from the first one, um, the second one, again, we provide some of the code to draw a blue square and we ask the students to add to that code by adding a user input over the top. So instead of always drawing a square with the same length side, the user can then input a side length. And so this is a scale and then some extra code requested from the students. The third one, we give them code to draw that blue square again and then we ask them to modify by adding onto the white square. And this one's got a little bit of a trick in there, I guess. Um, you can do it with all the blocks that are explicitly taught in the Blockly course, but there's an easier way of doing it using a block called go to. And so that gives students that have really explored and had a look beyond the course materials an opportunity to show what they know. Um, but it's absolutely solvable with the skills explicitly taught in the Blockly challenge. Now, this question, let me lift up my screen a little bit. Um, in this problem, the students are provided with code that draws a red and white flag. There's a bit of a maritime theme here. They're all based on <laughs> maritime flags and we ask them to again adapt that code to create an either or situation using an if else block so that depending on the user input the flag is either red and white or blue and yellow and to show those two options so we show the students what we expect and then we ask them to adapt this code to suit what's been asked Then we provide a little calculator and we ask the students to create this shape. So we move away from right angles into using some 45 degree turns. And the final question, which is quite involved, asks them to draw this shape. Um, now the complexity is not necessarily a great deal higher, but you'll notice for the first time there's a blank page. So we haven't provided a scaffold. Um, Nothing in that is beyond what's taught in the total course, uh, but putting it together, you know, there are quite a few steps in there and there's quite a lot of problem solving for the students to work their way through this challenge. So the rubric that uh, Sujatha will talk about is nicely spread across the whole level of abilities and outcomes for students and we want to have an opportunity, you know, right from A to E or whatever sort of labels you use on them in your jurisdictions to be able to really differentiate right up at the top as well as across the whole spectrum in terms of what's achievable. So now that you've seen the problems, I think I'll pass back to Sujatha to talk you through the rubric and explain how that works. Yep. Um, okay, so as Nicola said, um, it's got a bit of a maritime theme. Um, we use the maritime flags and so uh, it's quite a fantastic name. <laughs> um, so the rubric is designed to go across both tasks and you as, uh, as teachers can decide if you, if you just want to do part A uh, or if you just want to do part B or um, if you want to do both. So we tried to make it um, a little bit flexible in that regard. Um, so, okay, so that first criteria, modify and follow simple algorithms, uh, you'll notice is only a partial alignment. And we think it's really important to be um, honest about this because this, is, this does not cover the design part of algorithms that's required. So you need to make sure that if you do this, you provide an opportunity for students to still design an algorithm uh, in another part of their project or their learning uh, in digital technologies. So we've mapped the 
uh, questions in the worksheet. So part A, there are six questions. So if students can represent, um, can follow all the re given representations to accurately describe, and they can identify changes that are needed, uh, you can assume that they're at an A standard. So we've tried to uh, break this down. And as we get feedback from teachers, uh, when you've implemented and we get some work samples from teachers, uh, it will allow us to refine this. And this is like any teaching resource. Uh, when you create it, the first time you run it, um, you have uh, all these ideas. And then once you implement it, you know whether refinements and um, changes need to happen. So the next uh, criteria uh, is ACTDI P020, uh, and that's implementing in a visual programming language. So this covers all the questions in part B, which is the GROC online module. So if a student has submitted all the problems um, correctly and successfully, uh, we can say that they have met uh, the standard of, um, of an A. And again, progressively, uh, the, 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 the problems do get more complex. So question six is the trickiest. But if a student can show five out of six, and even if they don't get the sixth question, um, it still shows that they have a fairly good understanding of user input of control structures that are needed um, at a year five and year six level. And we've further broken that down into user input. So questions two, four, five, six, um, require using input and questions four, five, and six require branching and iteration. So we've really tried to address very, very specifically uh, what the curriculum needs and map them to individual questions. Uh, in terms of the rubric, uh, you may find that uh, the language used in this um, might be very complex for your students. Um, and again, um, we'd like to see how you can possibly simplify this based on um, the kids in your particular class. But this is really meant for teachers. Ideally, rubrics are meant to be for teachers and students. Uh, but again, that's a work in progress and we'll refine that once we have some feedback from uh, teachers across the country. And so if you, Nicola, if you can scroll down the page a little bit, please. Okay, perfect. So again, we've got controlled structures there. Um, and if a student can show that they can do controlled structures for four, five, and six, uh, again, they're at an A level. Um, if they can show it for question four or six, uh, there is enough there for us to say, okay, um, this kid can apply these concepts um, in some cases, but not all the cases that are needed or that we have in the particular assessment task. The last one, testing digital, could we get the rubrics? Absolutely. So that um, cmp.ac link that we shared earlier, um, this document is on there. So you can absolutely have a look at it. Uh, it is read only because uh, it's still a work in progress. But if you have a look at it, and if anything jumps out at you, we would love to hear from you. Um, because it just means we make the product just that little bit better for you. Uh, so the last one, test digital solutions. That's, a, that's quite a, uh, a tricky one to assess, but it's still important because it forms part of implementation. There are a few different ways that your student might test code. They might run it 20 times, but they might just submit it once. So you as the teacher could just see their submitted code, which may work, which may not work, but that doesn't give you the richness of data um, about how they actually test it. So some students, certainly when I've used some of these challenge resources in the past, I've had kids that have, a, that have run something 25, 30 times, uh, and they still don't get a successful answer, but they really, really tried their little hearts out. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a student that submitted it um, correctly on the first go. Um, it doesn't give me enough information uh, to assess them on testing. So we've left this deliberately broad because what we would like you as teachers to do here is to spend time with the kids to say, how are you testing it? So you as a teacher might say, okay, everyone, I'm going to ask you to um, describe what question five does and write down five different bits of data or bits of input that you will use to test question five. So even if a student doesn't successfully submit question five, you can still make a judgment about their ability to describe what the program is expected to do and outline how they might test the functionality of that. So that's the first part of that. And the second part of that, particularly in primary school, when um, programming can be really tricky for many, many students. We want to reward perseverance. We want to reward um, that little kid that tries 
his heart out, but may not just get there at the end. So if a student can get five out of six, they might be getting a B overall, but if they can show that they've tested it really extensively, then they can still get an A. So we're trying to separate some of the uh, expectations to say it's not a one, um, it's not a binary thing. It's not either you have it or you don't. Um, it's a fact that you could be really, really good at um, testing, uh, but you may not just be there in terms of your knowledge of how to sequence code and how to implement, say, control structures or user input. So we've tried to make it uh, a fair as assessment from that regard so that uh, you can value uh, the different elements of learning as you see it when your students submit uh, their answers to this assessment. Uh, so like we said, the uh, worksheet, there's the answer key and also the rubric. Uh, these are there for you to have a look at and um, um, give us some feedback on. Uh, and over the next few weeks, once we internally finish reviewing uh, um, the Grok module, uh, that'll be published as well on the ACA website. So we're gonna have a brand new category, which we're very excited about, um, called assessment. Uh, and those of you that are also teaching high school, um, tonight in parallel with this, uh, our colleagues, Bruce and Owen, have a um, high school assessment focused webinar and they've created um, assessment tasks that align to seven and eight as well. So those of you who particularly who teach year six, um, you might want to watch that webinar later on once it's online, uh, just to see how the expectations change. So our, our philosophy assessment remains the same. Um, differentiation where possible, try to have rubric that clearly articulate what the expectations are at every um, achievement level of the curriculum. Okay, um, was there anything I have forgotten here, Nicola? In terms of the rubric, or should we go back into the slide deck and look? Oh, in terms of the rubric, I just wanted to make sure that, were there any questions around the rubric? I know we're, it's a bit of a chat fest. We have an hour to get through a lot, um, but if you have any questions or things that jump out at you, please don't hesitate to pop it into the chat. We've got some time. Um, we can have a bit of a um, chat about it and, and it's certainly good feedback. I've got my pen and paper at the ready so that we can write down all the things we need to fix with this. And I might um, take back control of the screen and get back into sure. it as well so I can see the chat channel as well because I can't see that at the moment. That's okay. I know it's tricky. I've got three screens happening yeah, now. Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask them as well while we just rejig the screens a little bit to get ready for the next part. And Okay, so we got a question. The rubric seems more of a marking scheme. Would you get the students to help build a rubric for them to use? Absolutely. Um, depending on your school's philosophy, um, if you're um, in an environment where uh, your students are used to co-constructing learning, then absolutely um, showing them some of these expectations and asking them to say, okay, what would this look like? Um, how would you know if you've done what's expected? Um, definitely, if you can get your students to um, do that, and if you, uh, if you can build time in to do that, that's the ideal case scenario. So this, like we said, this is more like a marking scheme um, you can absolutely build it into the success criteria too. So uh, the success criteria for each problem is going to be slightly different. Um, so if you can break this down by problem by problem, um, definitely you can um, build them into the success criteria. And again, every student will be aiming it for a slightly different um, level of success uh, and showing students what that looks like would be um, really, really great. Okay, yep. So if you have questions, keep them coming through the chat channel. The other uh, thing we wanted to touch on briefly was formative assessment using the Grok Learning platform. Um, for those who are familiar with Grok Learning, this is a refresher, but oh gosh, gosh. Ooh, that was some feedback from my computer. Um, just give me one moment, sorry. My other computers come back to life. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at how you can monitor progress while you are working through these challenges with your students. Um, there are two things that teachers find very useful in terms of formative assessment. One of them is the teacher dashboard, which is available in Grok Learning. So when you enroll students in courses and assign them particular challenges, 
you're able to look at their progress. And this is um, a static screenshot here. But you can see for each of our students, um, you can see which courses they've been enrolled in. And for Cho Chang, which is a, we'd love to have Cho in her class. You can see for the DT Challenge Python chatbot, um, these green bars indicate problems that have been successfully solved by a student. And so you can see that, um, I get a great snapshot there and see that we're about halfway through the course and that everything seems to be going well. Now, further down, I can see for Hermione, which seems a little unfair, she's only just begun the course and the red bar means that um, there is a problem which has been submitted, which is incorrect. Now, when you're in the live version of the platform, you can click onto those green and orange bars and see exactly what screen your student is working on and where they're up to. So it's a very powerful tool to be able to look across your students at a point in time and see where they're up to. And this data is available every time you come back to the dashboard. So when you're in the classroom and wanting to have, or maybe even checking in once a week if it's a task that's assigned for homework, you're able to pop in and generally see how your students are going. Uh, the next tool that we have is a very recent one that um, you may not have had a chance to play with yet. It's our live view. So the data that comes on this screen um, gives you similar information, but it's presented in real time. So if you, particularly in the times of remote learning, were to say, let's work through a DT challenge during class time, you can open this dashboard and it looks like the class on my screen here began at about quarter past one. And you can see a series of icons next to each student's name. So you can see whether they are viewing things, uh, submitting them, running them, successfully completing or stalled. And this lets you see in real time, are your students working through as you expected or have they maybe been distracted, wandered off, stopped having a go and even categorized down the left there, you can see struggling, stalled, online or when they were most recently online. So this is a very powerful real-time tool that lets you have a look and see what your students are doing and monitor their progress and know when to jump in and offer some help. Uh, one of the things the teacher said, which was really great, she said, this helped us sort of differentiate between students who are genuinely struggling and those who are just not really having a go. And she could really powerfully see exactly where her students were at and how to help. So those are two tools that uh, we hope you find useful as you work through the challenges with your students. And just a reminder for everybody as we roll into the Q&A part of the webinar, um, assessment doesn't need to cover everything in one go. So any assessment task, you know, pick what's important to you in relation to that project or that set of lessons and which particular aspects you want to hone into for the assessment. You don't need to be assessing the whole DT curriculum in one go. You want to space things out over the year so students have lots of opportunities to show their learning and you can assess dis different aspects of that learning as you go throughout the year. Did you want to add to that one, Sujatha? Um, yeah, so I think uh, the key is sometimes assessment tasks become really, really big um, and they become quite overwhelming. And particularly in the primary years, um, you know, for F2, 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 three and four, um, providing lots of small opportunities to constantly um, see where kids are at and allow that, um, allow students to be able to monitor and plan their own learning is ideal uh, and providing many opportunities for them. It's, it's not always possible. I mean, you can't sometimes do two scratch projects a year, no matter how much you might want to, uh, but trying to provide opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning, whether it be formative or summative. Um, is really um, the ideal case scenario. So there was a question that just came through. I'm just typing on that. One of the questions is, how can teachers help if they're stuck themselves? That's a really great question. And um, it's something I can certainly empathize with because I've had uh, students do some of the courses um, some years ago when I first started. Um, and it was quite nerve wracking sometimes uh, to know that students might ask me a question and I don't know the answer. Uh, so all the ACA challenges, so all the problems have solutions to them, which you as teachers can access at any time. You don't have to do the problems or the challenges yourself. Uh, you can access the solution at any time. All the challenges also have extensive teacher notes. So we explain the concepts behind the scene. So if a kid has a particular um, 
is particularly finding one thing hard, like uh, iteration or variables, uh, we have explanations that will allow you to support their understanding and try and um, uh, try a few different ways for them to understand that concept. Um, we also have um, lesson plans uh, to support your teaching um, that again can uh, help you understand exactly what is uh, required. And at the end of the day, um, one of my philosophies has always been, and I, I had to get to this point, otherwise it became really, really um, unmanageable, was if I didn't know something, I would just sit with the student and say, okay, we're gonna have to figure this out together. And uh, modeling that kind of thing that it's okay not to know everything uh, is a really important part of programming. Students are going to hit roadblocks. They're gonna hit errors all the time. Uh, and being able to get over that is such an important part. Is Grok free? Um, Grok Learning, um, the challenges on Grok Learning um, that they have written are not free. So it's about $5 a year for primary students, um, but all the ACA challenges on the Grok platform are free for years three to eight, the DP challenges. Uh, and if you're a high school teacher or if you're working at a K to 12 school, um, we have the cybersecurity challenges for years seven to 12 uh, that are also funded. Um, the Grok challenges were free um, during the period of COVID, but I think that, is that right? It's coming to an end shortly, Nicola. Um, in terms of the non-ACA courses on Grok, they will um, stop being free from the 6th of July. So they have been free for a period of time. Um, if you're wanting to do some professional learning yourselves, a teacher account on Grok Learning is always free to access all of the content and a number of the courses are registered for NESA hours if you're in New South Wales. And so you can always get on there and try any course that you like the look of absolutely free of charge and investigate it and keep one step ahead of the students. Um, but if you're looking for free resources, anything with an ACA badge on it is free to access for the relevant year groups. So I've just posted a link. So that's on the Grok um, website and you can filter by author. So the Australian Computing Academy resources um, are free uh, and um, you can see and you can further filter by um, the platform, the language, um, the level and so on. Uh, and again, as Nicola mentioned, if you're in New South Wales, uh, you can get registered hours uh, if you do any one of these courses towards your maintenance of professional um, development and in other states, you can also use them um, for, towards your professional development. And if you, I know teachers have so much time on your hands, but if at all um, you can spare the time, um, doing one of these courses is fantastic professional learning uh, because it allows you to firstly um, know where the students will be, but also empathize with some of the roadblocks and anticipate where you uh, imagine your students are going to be stuck. We don't have that visibility. We don't know what Michael or Josh or Lynn is doing in your class, but you do. Uh, and so doing the challenge yourself, even if you're just one problem ahead of them, uh, just gives you that insight into um, how that is going to look like in terms of management and teaching in your classroom. Actually, I did one of them recently and I left it till the last minute and I had a deadline and I got stuck. <laughs> and it was <laughs> really an example of uh, putting myself in a student's shoes. I really learned a lot about, um, you know, even just that sense of panic, like, oh my gosh, I can't get it done in the time I have. What am I going to do? And, and having to slow down and work through it was really helpful. Yeah, and bear in mind, um, the assessment we've given you today is only aligned to uh, digital technologies. There is so much more you can do in terms of um, general capabilities, critical and creative thinking, um, collaboration if you get your students to do pair programming, um, definitely general ICD capabilities. We haven't even touched that, uh, but there's a whole lot you can do in terms of mapping uh, some of these challenges to the general capabilities that you need to cover in your, um, in your classroom. So we've got a few minutes left, uh, but uh, we're online till about five. If there's any other questions, we'd love to um, hear from you. So pop it into the chat. Uh, we've got our contact details. Nicola, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, if you end up using these resources, we would love to hear from you. We need to know what worked. Uh, more importantly, we need to know how can it be made better. Uh, and what we would particularly like is work samples. Um, you know, obviously take away student names so that it's anonymized, but we'd really love to see how these translate to uh, a wide range of classrooms across the country. We're trying to create resources that work for all 
um, lots of different classrooms. We know it'll be successful in some places, probably needs a bit more work in other places. Uh, and we would love to be able to work on that and refine this to make this really helpful. Uh, was there anything else? We've got an early bark for people, Nicola. What about that? I think that's how great are we? <laughs> I'm so impressed to everyone that's come along today and um, we hope this is helpful for you all. So thank you for your time this afternoon and um, we hope the last week of term is brilliant. And if you're already on holiday, we don't want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Really, really lovely to see you all and um, hopefully see you at a future ACA event, whether face-to-face -face or online. Lovely. Bye, everybody.